Hi everyone. In my last video entitled Why Catholic, I told you that the one of the reasons and the big reason that I remain Catholic is that I have and you know Catholics <laughs> have the extreme privilege of receiving Jesus body, blood, soul and divinity into our bodies during Holy Communion at Mass. So you may be asking how in the world does this happen and how in the world can you possibly believe that? <laughs> so let me first explain the word transubstantiation. It, the word trans means across or over and substantia, the root word means substance. So transubstantiation then means to go from one crossover from one substance to another. And I'm going to be quoting from an article by Father Michael von Schlun in Catholic News Service. It's called Transubstantiation Not as Difficult as It Sounds. So he says there are two initial substances within the Eucharist, the ones that we see, bread and wine. They cross over to two entirely new and different substances, the body and blood of Christ. It is no longer bread, but the body of Christ under the appearance of bread. No longer wine, but the blood of Christ under the appearance of wine. Well, who first explained this? Who came up with this idea? At the Last Supper, Jesus explained it to us. In the gospel we read, Jesus took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and said, Take and eat, this is my body. That's from Matthew chapter 26, verse 26. And so you might be thinking, okay, Jesus did it at the Last Supper, and I believe that. I mean, I believe he was telling the truth. The uh, Apostles probably didn't exactly understand what he was talking about, but they accepted it on faith from Jesus. But, you know, how do we believe that's still happening in the world today? Well, let me finish and tell you. The verb choice, says Father, is intentional and crucial. Jesus says, is. He did not say that the bread is a reminder, a memento, a symbol, a piece of bread that is especially spiritually important. Jesus said the bread is his body. He also said, I am the living bread that come down from heaven. This is from John chapter six, verse 51. If Jesus said that the bread is changed into his body, then we accept it as a matter of faith. Same thing with the blood. Jesus said, this is my blood. So how does it happen in churches today, in Catholic churches today? Who supplies this power that causes the change to take place? The Eucharistic prayer is offered by the priest in the name of Jesus. It is addressed to God the Father and at the epiclesis, it's another word for another day. When the priest extends his hands over the bread and wine, the Holy Spirit is called upon so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Transubstantiation takes place at the moment of the consecration when the priest pronounces the words, this is my body and this is the chalice of my blood. And if you've been to a Catholic Mass, you know, if you're kind of fall, falling asleep in the pew, the bells ring at the moment of consecration, and that's a little wake up for you that, hey, the miracle is taking place right now. Pay attention. The priest pronounces these words, but their power and grace are God's said St. John Chrysostom, as quoted in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, um, 1375, number 1375. 
So that's a little explanation of where Catholics get this idea from. Um, it's, it's actually not just an idea, it's a mystery. And even though it's a mystery, nonetheless, it is a reality. Jesus promised when he went up, back up into heaven at the ascension, uh, that he would send us his Holy Spirit and that he would never leave us alone until the end of time. And the Eucharist is one way that Jesus has stayed with us physically, even though we can't see him. Um, it's a way that he has stayed with us physically, you know, over the last 2,000 years or a little less than 2,000 years. And um, it's a very beautiful, beautiful way. Uh, receiving Jesus into your body it is like the closest you can get to um, heaven while here on earth. It's the closest you can get to him. Now, in order to receive Holy Communion, you have to be in um, a state of grace. You have to be free from mortal sin. And uh, you have to be a Catholic. <laughs> you have to believe that what you are receiving is truly um the body and blood of Christ. If you're not there yet, then that is fine. Um, pray about it. Ask God to uh, convict your heart to, you know, to help you to believe. But we definitely don't want to receive Jesus in Holy Communion if we have mortal sin, you know, serious sin on our soul that we have not confessed or if we don't believe that it's really Jesus that we are receiving, that would be really bad. So I wanna move on and I wanna tell you about a really cool young man. I'm trying to advance this page a little more and it won't let me, there you go. This guy at the bottom, he is Blessed Carlo Acutis. He was a 15-year-old who was um, a computer geek, uh, a computer genius, and uh, also a very holy young man. He went to daily mass uh, for many years of his life. Um, anyway, he died, I believe, of leukemia at the age of 15. But before he died, he, he was so in love with Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. He called it the highway to heaven. And he wanted to convince the world about what a miracle this is, that we can receive Jesus in this manner. So he set to work putting together a website that listed all of the Eucharistic miracles that have taken place in the world. So I want to show you some of them. Let's see if I'm, there we go. Here is um, the website, the Eucharistic Miracles of the World, and you can choose your language. I'm gonna choose English. <laughs> and if you scroll down, you will see miracles listed by country. And a big, big one um, that everyone talks about and goes to see, it might've been the first one, I'm not sure, was the miracle at Lanciano, Italy. We'll click on that. And you can see pictures and a little description here. But it was scientifically studied. And I'm gonna read just a little bit to you at the bottom, if I can find my readers. Here we go. In 1970, the Archbishop of Lanciano and the Provincial Superior, blah, 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 um, <laughs> requested Dr. Edward Linoli, director of the Hospital of Arezzo and professor of anatomy, histology, chemistry, and clinical microscopy to perform a thorough scientific examination on the relics of the mir miracle which had occurred 12 centuries earlier. On March 4, 1971, the professor presented a detailed report of the various studies carried out. Here are the basic results. 
Number one, the miraculous flesh is authentic flesh consisting of muscular striated tissue of the myocardium. That's heart tissue. Jesus gives us his heart. Isn't that like awesome? Number two, the miraculous blood is truly blood. The chromatographic analysis indicated that with absolute and indisputable certainty. The immunological study shows with certitude that the flesh and blood are human and are type AB blood. The same type of blood of the man of the Shroud of Turin and the type most characteristic of Middle Eastern populations, which is uh, where Jesus was from, right? All right, so I just, it's, I love reading about these. This is so, so fascinating to me. All right, I want to show you one more real quickly. This one is fairly recent, and this one took place in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Again, here's the pictures, all the stories. Um, I will put the link to the Eucharistic Miracles website underneath so you can check it out yourself. Uh, but again, a scientist um, did test on this host that began bleeding, and which was not host, <laughs> but he didn't know that it was not just a piece of bread. Um, it was kind of like a blind study. They did not tell the scientist what it was that he was studying. So his findings were incredible. It says, let's see, it says that when the sample was sent in 2002, um, Professor John Walker at the University of Sydney in Australia confirmed that the sample showed muscle cells and intact white blood cells and that everyone knows that white blood cells outside of your body disintegrate after 15 minutes. And in this case, six years had passed. Um, the findings about the blood type, the type of tissue, were the same findings with the miracle in Lanciano, which had happened <laughs> centuries um, before. So AB blood type. Um, he even said that there was like um, scar tissue or something showing that the person whose blood this was or the person whose body this is had been badly beaten. So I encourage you to read it all for yourself. Very fascinating. Now the last thing I want to leave you with is this. Um, here we go. Blessed Carlo Acutis died in 2006, and when his case for beatification, um, the path to sainthood, came up, they exhumed his body. And you can see here, it's so cool, <laughs> that he's a young person in a <laughs> jogging jacket, um, and he looks like he's just sleeping. Now, I did a little digging to find out if he is one of those that we call incorrupt. In other words, his body did not decay. And he was not completely incorrupt. They said much of his body was intact. Um, his organs were intact. But they had to do a little work on the face. <laughs> um, his face had decayed a bit um, before they um, put it on display for people to venerate. And um, this is the symbol of Jesus in the Eucharist that is on this um, glass coffin um, where he is. So I, I think the thing that fascinates me the most about incorruptibles is that um, it's kind of like a sign to us of, number one, perhaps the person's holiness, and also of the re resurrection of, you know, the life to come for us, to give us hope. And um, so there you have it.
transubstantiation, Eucharistic miracles. I'll put the links below and I hope that you will do some digging for yourself. Y'all have a good one.